use case over the 90 days by completing 10 different missions and this is going to touch various aspects of DevOps technologies. I'll talk about the use case, I'll talk about the missions, and then we'll get started with our first uh, mission today. So what are the missions that we're going to complete over the next uh, 90 days or let's say about 10 weeks approximately with some breaks in between? So the first mission is where you, uh, you would basically start deploying application with containers. So you learn about containers learn how to uh, run applications, connect them together, uh, run with the microservices, and then, uh, you know, basically deploy those with containers, right? Uh, let me first start talking about the use case that you're going to build. And before that, let's just start talking about, uh, let's say, uh, some session context. So hi to everyone. I see Rohit, Pawan, Irene, uh, Viri Dinesh, Abhishek, Praveen, Anthony, Arisa, Sakshi, Sukhvi, uh, Sukhveen Pal, Ashwini, Pradeep, Venkatesh, Sai, uh, welcome everyone and uh, welcome to this 90 day challenge. I'm really excited. I hope you are too. And uh, uh, let me first start talking about the use case that you're going to build here, right? And this is a, a special application, a specialized learning application that I have created uh, this year. And I call it as an ultimate learning app. Why do I call it as an ultimate learning app? And this is a this is the application that you see here. It's a microservices polyglot application stack, very real life like scenario, uh, but it's not a real life you know uh, you know uh, application. And there are some reasons for it. It's been created specially tailor made for the learning uh, and learning, especially the DevOps technologies here. Now, what is this application? This is a uh, this is a origami mega store. Uh, think of it as origami mega store or you can actually think of it as a, any e-commerce platform because it has all those properties of an e-commerce platform for example this is the front end that you see here which is connected to multiple backend services uh, one of that is this is the architecture so we have front end application we have a catalog service we have a recommendation engine we have a voting application here and how does it work so you can see the front end connected to various different services the all of these services come together to show you this one page this is how the modern applications are also built so this is a modern tech stack so why i say it's a modern polyglot tech stack is because you see uh, front end being built in node.js catalog service in python using flask uh, voting application with spring boot java and recommendation engine using Golang. And you can optionally integrate this with databases such as uh, Postgres and Mongo. And all of these are the latest and the greatest of the technologies. And this is from the Stack Overflow Survey of 2023. Uh, that's the latest that we have right now. And you can see that Node.js, React, all of these are Node.js uh, based. Then we have uh, uh, Flask Python applications, Spring Boot, uh, Django again, Python application, and so on. If you look at the databases, which are uh, cloud services that are AWS, so we're going to include all of these technologies as part of our uh, project here. Database wise, Postgres, MySQL, Mongo, uh, other top ones. And uh, uh, these are the technologies like languages like Python and SQL and Java and C. Uh, so we have taken all these best uh, modern technology stack. And based on that, I've created this use case and it's a very realistic application. So why uh, I call it as an ultimate learning app is because it is a real life like application. So think of it as an e-commerce platform. You can easily modify by just changing the catalog. You can make it an e-commerce platform as well. So it is it has all those components which are relevant uh, for an e-commerce platform. So it's a very real life like application. Polyglot microservices stack, so multiple microservices uh, uh, there. It's a modern tech stack, I just mentioned about it. So we are also gonna use all the modern technologies. This is from our DevOps skills report for 2022 to 2023. And you can see what technologies matter in the job industry. And we've taken all the top technologies. For example, infrastructure as a code wise, we'll be working on Terraform. We'll be working on AWS cloud, the number one cloud so far. Uh, Kubernetes and Docker, a lot of that we'll uh, use here. Uh, CI wise, we will use Jenkins. CD wise, we'll use Argo CD. And, uh, you know, we're going to put that as part of our missions. That's what our missions are basically to deploy something and learn one of this technology every week. 
and uh, uh, you can see all the components which are useful for a DevOps perspective. For example, it is a simple application, very simple design uh, using modern technology. It is iterative. So this is the actual application that you see running. And you can see all the components which are very useful. Like you have catalog, you have voting service, you have recommendation engine. Plus you have the backend services. For a DevOps engineer, it is important to know oh, whether the backend service is up or not. And it is important to get that visual feedback. And we have that feedback here. So what services are up? And if I stop some services, which I'm going to do from here, I'll stop one of the service, or let's say, I'll stop the recommendation engine. As soon as I stop the recommendation engine, you're going to see this component gone, but it doesn't like create an error. It's very seamless. That's why we call it as an iterative expandable service. You can see the status of both the services, voting and recommendation being down. So very useful app to get a feedback, especially when you're learning, you want this visual feedback. If I stop the catalog service, for example, uh, everything except for the front end will be down, but still you get the front end, you get the system information, you get the status, you get the version. So when you do version uh, updates like deployments, this is quite useful. So I've put in my 15 years of experience of teaching, working as a DevOps profession, uh, teaching to the DevOps professionals and uh, created this ultimate learning app, which is what we're gonna build here, uh, you know, the application or implement the DevOps technologies for. How are we gonna go about it? We'll implement it or build this project, end-to-end -end project by breaking it down into 10 different missions. Every week, there'll be one mission that we will take during these live classes, we'll come and learn some concepts about it. I'll demonstrate certain things. And you can possibly, if you are a member, uh, you can go back and complete those missions. You'll have access to the courses, projects, labs uh, through our membership platform as well. Now these classes, the live classes remain free and open for all. And if you want to take it further and really implement it, you can opt for the membership as well. Now, what are the missions that we're gonna complete? The first mission is we'll deploy stuff with Docker. Uh, second mission, again, related to Docker. So you'll take this four applications and containerize it. So you will build the container images. We will talk about Docker files and how to package the application into container images uh, there. Then we uh, will start Gitifying. Gitifying is where we'll implement Git-based workflows. How do we collaborative uh, set up collaborative workflows and branching models like we do in the real application or real organizations. So we'll implement that with pull request, code reviews, uh, implement trunk-based development model. So it's not just about basic revision control. We'll actually do stuff that is done in the real organizations. We'll then set up a continuous integration pipeline with Jenkins. Uh, we will then set up a, a cloud infrastructure with AWS. We'll uh, further set up auto scaling, etc. So some more advanced version of cloud, uh, you know, set up there. We'll set up Terraform. Uh, so automate the cloud infrastructure using Terraform. We will also use uh, Kubernetes later and deploy stuff, uh, deploy all these applications with Kubernetes. We will set up automated delivery on Kubernetes using Ergo CD. And uh, the next last mission, the last week, last 10 mission 10 will be, we set up monitoring with Prometheus, Grafana, and uh, the family, right? So that monitoring stack is what we will deploy. So this should cover most useful DevOps practices. And it's not just about talking about this practices as a concept, you will actually implement it with this use case. That is the whole idea. So by the end of this 90 days session or 90 day challenge, uh, you could have an actual, you know, realistic, application project built with all the, you know, all the practices implemented and you learn through that, learn a lot through that. Uh, that is the idea, right? So you will have, uh, Ajay, you will have recordings later. So you can watch, if you have missed the first part, you will, you can watch the recordings later. So in terms of uh, the access, uh, all of you can attend the sessions, live sessions. Uh, these are open for all. You will also have access to the recordings for five days. You will receive an email after, let's say, four hours or so. You will receive an email with the recording, link to the recording, and you can watch it for about five days. If you want to take action and really implement it, I will be sharing an offer at the end of the 
end of this session that you can use to join the membership if you are not a member already. All right, so uh, that is uh, what I would be sharing. All the resources, all the projects, all the labs, all the courses will be available through our membership platform if you want to take uh, this to the further level. Now, uh, the mission one is what we will get started with. That's about Dockerate. Uh, we call it as a Dockerate. Basically, we want to deploy this stack uh, and you will basically be launching this entire stack like I have done here uh, using Docker. Let me just bring up all the services again. All right. If you have questions, by the way, you can put it in the Q&A. You can put it in the chat. You can also use the Q&A, which is on this side of uh, the screen, basically. Right. So uh, with recordings, you can possibly try to replicate what I'm trying to do, but uh, you will get the best value uh, if you have access to the labs and projects and uh, the rest of the specification, because all the project specification, the video courses that you will go through, and the labs will be available as part of the membership. Just to make it clear on the question by Amit. Uh, all right, so this is what you will end up building uh, or setting up by the end of this session. Uh, and you will learn how to basically set up this with Docker, basically this entire application stack with four services. I have four containers running here. Let me just show you that. Uh, so I have four containers running these four services. Now, how does this work? What are containers? How do you launch those containers? How do you connect to those containers? How do you connect one container with another? Uh, that's what uh, we would be talking about during this uh, session, right? So we'll get started with our first mission that is about Dockerate. And to understand how to deploy this application stack, something like this and launch it with Docker, you need to understand what containers are in the first place. You need to understand how to launch containers you need to understand how to troubleshoot uh, some basic things related to containers. And you will also need to understand how the port mapping works, how the linking works, and uh, we'll also talk about the technologies under the hood. So let's get started with that, right? Uh, I'll be taking questions uh, towards the end for sure. And if possible, if I get chance in between, I'll take those as well. But we want to focus on, you know, teaching and uh, uh, I'll be looking at the question as I get a chance here, right? Now, uh, let's get started talking about container-based delivery here. That's uh, very important to understand for everything that we do uh, from here on, right? Uh, we, are, we are basically using modern technology stack for this application, and we, we will be building a container-based delivery with Docker, with Kubernetes, with Argo CD. All of this is related to containers, right? Now, from that point of view, it's important to understand how container-based delivery works in general. And uh, let's get started talking about that first. Now, why would you want to use containers? Anyone, you can put your thoughts on the chat. So, you know, what are the advantages of using containers? I'd love to know uh, what your thoughts are. Okay. Containers are, why to use containers uh, rather than a traditional way of uh, delivering a software? That's the question here. And uh, containers are definitely fast. They're lightweight, give you portability. So we have all these advantages out there. And the biggest advantage there is the consistency that it gets, right? And Rajesh says, uh, consistent environment is what um, Wami says, portability, yes, all of lay. Uh, Rajesh says, uh, you know, development and environment. I mean, you have basically parity between staging and production and dev environments and so on. Uh, they're lightweight and easily deployable. Sure. Uh, Rupal says easy to boot up. Yeah. Uh, Shuvinpal says lightweight. Pradeep says small images and easy to move. Uh, move. Amit says lightweight. Yeah. Uh, it won't affect the system. Anything that you can do in containers. Sure, John. Uh, easy for migration. Uh, that's the portability. Yes. So um, uh, that's uh, that's correct. Uh, Hertz says to get things inside instead of using separate. So everything is packaged inside. Right. Uh, so all of these are great um, inputs. 
And all of these are advantages. And the biggest advantage with containers is the consistency that it brings in, just like the real world shipping containers. Because if you look at the shipping containers, right, and the way we package things and, you know, uh, shipped it and the way logistics worked before containers came into horizon was if you wanted to transport, let's say, car versus oil versus grains versus maybe cloths, um, something else maybe, right? Or um, everything would depend on the kind of goods that you have, the way you package it, the way you ship it, the way you handle it at the destination, every on the kind of goods that you had until one fine day containers just showed up and it changed the world. The way we, it's just standardized everything, right? Because in today's world, it's no more dependent on the goods as long as you can take your goods and package it into that container box, you know, everyone knows how to handle it across the globe. This is standardized across the globe. There are locks at the same place. There are barcodes at the same places. And you can, you, you have, you know, uh, tools and devices created to handle those containers, you know, uh, manage those that dockyards and so on. And you can take that container and put it on a truck, put it on a train, put it on a ship. Uh, everything is standardized. That's what is happening with the software delivery today. Our goods, the one we build, the one we package are the application that we have. Like we have Java applications versus Node applications versus uh, Python applications and whatnot, right? And so far, everything depended on the kind of application that we had. Like if you have a Java application, create a jar file, maybe uh, share it with artifact, uh, artifactory or something like that. Uh, Node.js, maybe create NPM packages, have put it on NPM repository or Python, maybe create a zip file and share it, or uh, maybe put it as a Python egg and a, in, in a particular repository, right? So every specific application needed to be handled in a certain way, needed to be packaged in a certain way, needed to be run in a certain way. And that's what is being standardized and changed with the containers, with the container images, uh, the same thing that it is doing as container, uh, real world logistic containers do, right? It offers you that standard packaging format and you take your application along with everything that is needed. For a Java application, you know you don't deploy just a jar file and package it. You take that jar file or a WAR file, add whatever else is needed, maybe a Tomcat, maybe some libraries, maybe SSL, maybe uh, even the operating system files. So you package everything that is needed so it becomes a self-contained portable package as many of you mentioned. And that makes it simple, portable and that creates that layer of standardization because you can take that package then and run it on a laptop. It works the same way in a data center and it can work on a cloud as well, as long as there is this layer of container runtime or an orchestration engine along with that available to you, right? And that's what simplifies everything. That's what standardizes everything. So containers are pretty much standardizing the way we are packaging we are running the software and the ecosystem, Kubernetes completely standardizes the way we run it today, right? And that simplifies everything, the way you do CI, CD, the way you, you know, build application, distribute it, package it, um, run it, everything is pretty much standardized and it ha brings in a lot of advantages like parity between dev and prod and stage, uh, simplicity. And um, since we get a portable self-sufficient package, if you want to run and try out any application, you can just bring in an existing package and run it uh, like that, just like that, right? Now, that's what the advantage of containers are. Now, how containers are then different than running application directly on a physical server, bare metal, or maybe something that we already know about like VMs. So just let's just do a comparison between bare metals, VMs, and containers, especially to understand by learning about or comparing it with something that we already know about, like for, for example, VMs, right? Now, ultimately, remember that it's all about the application, whether you're running it via bare metals, VMs, containers, we are in the business of running the applications, right? Uh, we're not in business of running an infrastructure, even if you're a DevOps engineer, even if you're a data center engineer, uh, the whole reason why that exists is because we want to run some application, uh, provide some value 
and uh, you know that's how things work right and to run that application we need the infrastructure so let's take an example of a bare metal system or uh, let's say bare metal or um, the physical servers that we have we take the application application cannot run out of thin air so we need an environment so environment such as libraries binaries uh, the base operating system etc and then we have the kernel you know inside that as well operating system comes with a kernel and the kernel is an interface for the application to get access so when application wants to run get some cpu cycles wants to get some memory access all of that happens through the kernel and a lot more right so the kernel is an integral part of the operating system so you have the underlying hardware as well that's an interface right uh, so on a bare metal system you can run or install one or more application on the same system and it has this shared libraries binaries and uh, everything else that kind of an environment right that's how you run it with bare metal that's how we started you know deploying our applications initially but the problem with this is with bare metal we typically have to if you're you know i have been part of the teams which were responsible for building a data center as well so with bare metals you always have to estimate the capacity uh, over provision it you typically based on your usage plus some buffers and uh, you'll always over provision under utilize the capacity and a typical average utilization of a bare metal system is 10 to 10 to 12 percent actually maybe 10 to 15 percent you can take right not more than that on an average so how do we get more out of this hardware is where we came up with this technology called as virtual machines that's where we have hypervisors or different types of VMs, mainly hypervisor, but there are different types of VMs. And you have the hardware, you have the kernel on top of that, you have a layer of hypervisor. And with the same hardware, we can get maximum out of it by running more than one virtual machines on top of that. And when you talk about cloud, like AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, cloud is nothing but virtual machines offered in a managed environment. So when you say EC2 instances or Azure VMs, uh, those are just the you know virtual machines on uh, running in a cloud environment, uh, managed environment rather, and that's what we came up with uh, to optimize the hardware utilization, right? And our hardware utilization went from 10% to maybe 25%, right? We could still do better, and uh, uh, there is an overhead when it comes to VM or bare metal. There is always an overhead of running that you know operating system and everything else uh, along with your application again going back to our original goal we are in business of running applications it's all about applications right so if someone gave us a way to run the application out of a thin air we would possibly take it right it's not the case with vms or bare metals because if you look at the linux boot process for bare metals or vms it starts with a bias uh, maybe virtual or a physical bias there is a master boot record comes the bootloader, then you have initial RAM disk, then you have kernel, uh, initial RAM disk, and then actual process application, right? And every single VM, you just want to run the application if possible, but there is an overhead of running all of this, booting all of this, because that is required overhead for running a VM or a bare metal system, right? You can't just run an application out of a thin air on a especially on a vm kind of an environment so there is an always an overhead of running that and that is where containers and come and change the game because containers give us exactly what we want it gives us a way to run the application and just the application without worrying about the overhead that comes with the vm etc right so with containers we have the hardware the operating system with the kernel instead of a hypervisor layer you will install the container runtime and on top of that, you just start running your applications just like that, just like a thin air. So if you want to compare it with VM, it looks like this with a VM with the, all the overhead in addition to the application versus a container where you just have a container and container alone. That's it, nothing else there, right? So it is looks like it's running out of a thin air. It's not, it, I mean, there is a uh, there are some technologies behind the scene but that's the difference between a vm and a container i'll show you by uh, actually demonstrating this so i have a vm created this is a cloud server which is nothing but a vm created on i use a digital ocean clouds it's running there 
And this is a typical VM where you see your application may be running somewhere here, but there are like 50, 100 or the odd processes that you still see running. This is the overhead we are talking about that comes with a VM. It's an essential overhead to run the VM. Let me run a container on top of this same VM. Container needs an image, just like VMs, VMs do. So it has some similarity there. But beyond that, if you look at it, the moment I launch the container, things will be different. So Luke, uh, yes, the webinar will be recorded. You'll have access to it for five days. Okay, I've launched the container. I'll connect to it. And uh, you can see the difference now. So if you look at the processes inside the container, it just has the only the process that I started this with. That's it, nothing else. I just want to show you side-by-side -side comparison. So left-hand side is the VM. Uh, sorry, left-hand side is the container. Right-hand side is the VM. You can see the difference, right? So VM has such an overhead. Containers just have the processor that it requires. Now, why are we comparing VMs with containers is because instead of running your application as a VM, you can package it and run it as a container as well. It can very well run on top of VM, which could be the most likely case. But if you look at the comparison, uh, it gives you the isolated environment with a lot less overhead. It has a lot of isolation, just like a VM, a VM has. So let me show you that concept, right? A container has its own processes with its own process IDs. You can see that. It has its own network, for example. Okay, let me install the same command. container has its own network as well. So you can see that there is a network interface, there is an IP address, this is different than the IP address of the VM. This container is running on top of this VM, yes, but it has its own network stack, so it looks like an isolated environment. You can see that it has its own operating system files as well. So here we have Ubuntu, here we have uh, Alpine. Right, so you have Alpine versus Ubuntu. So it has its own file system, operating system, it has its own network, it has its own uh, processes, it can have its own uh, set of, let's say, different uh, uh, levels of isolation it has. Just like a VM, it looks like an isolated environment. And this is possible because uh, containers are typically run on a operating system like Linux and it's the kernel which uh, creates, has certain technologies inside it, which makes containers possible. Now, what are those technologies which make containers possible? This contained environment or the isolated environment possible? The first technology which comes into play is called as a kernel namespaces. Very important. It's been there on Linux for decades, but uh, there were some other technologies which were missing, which were added later in 20, uh, 2000s, and which is what made containers uh, like a common uh, technology today, right? Uh, so what are those uh, technologies under the hood? So the first technology which makes containers possible in the first place is the namespaces. So what you see is isolated layers here. So when I created the container, you have, you see it has its own network. You see it, you have its, it has its own image and a root file system. All of these are namespaces. There are like six or seven namespaces out there. Uh, out of that, the five main include the MNTR file system namespace, which gives its own, own operating system. So this has its own operating system files. Linux operating system is just a set of files. So it has Alpine Linux running on top of Ubuntu, right? So that's the level of isolation. Every container can have its own image via the mount or a uh, root file system namespace. There is also a network namespace, uh, which gives its own network stack, it, its own ETH0 interface, its own IP, etc. 
uh, you know, which is different than the zero here. Now, why these are called as namespaces is because there is some mapping. The actual interface. So this container is running on the VM that you see here. Uh, and what happens is uh, the actual network is running on the underlying host that it, it is running on. So there is always a mapping. So what you see, what appears like a virtual environment or an isolated environment is an actual something, an entity on the underlying host. This should be very clear when, when you look at uh, the PID. For example, a namespace is what appears as a PID number one within the container is an actual PID that you see somewhere here. So this shell process is uh, probably running somewhere here with this container D. I can show you by using this option. So you can see this container D has spawned off the shell. So whatever the shell processes that you see, one and eight, PID number one and PID number eight is actual PID number 5418 and 5454 actually, right? So this is called as a namespacing. So there is a mapping and it looks like an isolated environment, but the actual process is running on the underlying host. That's why it does not need to boot anything. It's just running on the same host uh, with the same kernel and the kernel provides this isolation uh, through the namespaces. So when you run a container, it's an application running with the layers of these namespaces, which gives you a feel that it's a contained or a isolated environment. Same with network. Network you can also see here. So you have this ETH0 and you can uh, see the actual implementation as well. So network namespace is implemented, for example, using a VETH pair, a virtual Ethernet pair. And you can see the pairing as well. So this every interface has a number. So this interface E0 has a number five. And what it pairs with is int interface number six. What is interface number six? Interface number six is on the host side. It's called as V it's something. And that pairs with interface number five. So essentially, this E0 is nothing but the V interface on the host. This is a FIFO pipe. So first in first out pipe. So whatever you put in here comes out of here. Whatever you put in here comes out of here. That's how this works. That's how the namespaces work. And these namespaces are the ones which are responsible for creating these containers, what we call as containers basically. And that's the fundamental technology which makes containers possible. Very important to know. And this is the foundational technology, right? Uh, if you have questions, again, you can start putting it in the Q&A. Uh, out there, I'll start addressing them as uh, I see uh, relevant. Okay, so namespace is the fundamental technology, which is what makes it possible to run containers. And that's also the reason why you typically have containers have certain restrictions. You can run Linux containers on Linux environment. So you can have Ubuntu system and run Linux CentOS versus something else. And if you want to run Windows containers, you need a Windows operating system because you're sharing the kernel. So everything is shared right between the host, which is the right hand side, the VM, which is the Linux environment and the container, which is on the left hand side that you see here. Right. So that's uh, how containers work. That's how these underlying technologies work namespaces. And the second technology is Google's contribution to the world of containers. Uh, do you know when Google started migrating their production workload to containers? Which year? I mean, uh, that's a question. If anyone knows, you can put it in the chat. Just to give you a reference, Docker was uh, created. Docker as a software came out in late 2012. Early 2013, it became very popular. So when did Google move to containers is the question. Yeah, so thanks for the mentioning the seventh namespace, Devendra. So there are about seven namespaces uh, uh, in total out there. So yeah, I think there's a comment from Suvin Pal. Knowing namespaces are crucial when deploying application. Yes. So uh, see, there are namespaces at different levels. Okay, what we are talking about are kernel namespaces. Even in Kubernetes, there is a different namespace concept. So we will talk about that when we go to Kubernetes. 
But right now, what we are talking about is uh, kernel namespaces. So in two, 2000s, it's not 2015, it's not, uh, it's in 2000s, it's not 2007. Uh, 2007 was C groups uh, came in, but Google started migrating their workloads to containers uh, in 2003, around 2003 and 4. Okay, and they created a system called as uh, it's a four letter word. Uh, does anyone know about it? And that is the inspiration. The Kubernetes came from that project. Actually, Kubernetes is an inspiration uh, taken from that project. Uh, that Google started and Google uses that orchestration engine internally or they started using that created that first then came another one but uh, it's a four letter word starting with B uh, if anyone knows put it in the chat okay talking about C groups uh, C groups is a contribution of Google so when Google moved to containers the uh, namespaces was a concept which was already present in Linux it had been present since uh, 70s actually uh, but there was something else missing that was how do we control resources because let's say you run containers on a host there are two containers one of that has a memory leak what it's going to do is it's going to start eating up the memory for all the other containers and even affect the performance of the system how do we control it is where we needed a technology to put some control or a limit that's when google created something called as process groups and it became part of the kernel later and it uh, became C groups or control groups uh, later in somewhere in 2007 and then came 2008 was when uh, you know all of this becomes uh, became a de facto uh, features of kernel and came LXC that led to docker later okay so uh, what is the role of a C group it's a two, two, two fold role uh, one is to control resources what resources there are only four things to control CPU, memory, disk, IO, that is the IO speed and the network, right? So that's what you, what it controls. And it also does the resource accounting as in it does the monitoring. I'll show you here. Uh, you have Docker stats API, which can help you Docker stats command, which gets you the same data. So it's monitoring CPU, memory, network IO and the block IO, which is the disk, right? So those are the four things that it can control and it can also monitor. That's what Docker stats shows you. This is done via the C groups internally, right? So uh, C groups has two purposes to control the resources. You can put a limit on a CPU or a memory and uh, that container will only get that much. It cannot cross that boundary. And later on in Kubernetes, you can use some abstraction with resource configuration and define like how much CPU, how much memory should be associated with a particular container or a pod in Kubernetes. So that's what the role of C groups is. So it is simple. You define typically you define using this uh, milli core concept in Kubernetes where one core, it could be a physical or a virtual core. One core is thousand milli. It's a milli. So one thousandth. Right, so one core is thousand milli. So you typically in Kubernetes see five hundred milli core, two hundred m, five hundred m, five thousand m. Uh, that refers to the milli core. This two hundred milli core or m means one fifth of the CPU core is been uh, set as a resource constraint or a limit there. Uh, that's how this works. So C, uh, C groups and namespaces two important technologies you must know about with respect to Docker. Uh, okay, so absolutely right answer by Abhimanyu, Sharad, Cedric, Amit, Skanda. Uh, so Google created a system called as Borg and based on Borg came Kubernetes. So there is, that's the story we'll talk about when we go to Kubernetes. But Borg was Kubernetes, uh, Google's original orchestration engine. Later came on Omega in 2009. And uh, in 2014, they started working on Kubernetes, which was released in 2015. And uh, rest is the history. All right. So can we con create different C groups and assign each C group to a group of containers? So you can, uh, you typically will define the C groups per container, but there are things that you can do advanced things where you can share the C groups between the containers and share certain things like network namespaces and all that, that 
is possible uh, uh, with the kernel configuration, the specific configuration. All right. In case if you're getting some technical issues, you may want to just try to refresh the window and see if that works for you. All right. Now we'll talk about two more technologies which are quite useful in the world of containers. One is, these are related to images basically. The way layering works, the images work and how uh, containers make it very efficient, right? Now we'll compare it with the VMs. So VMs, you can deploy it with images also. Let's say you are, uh, you need an image to run a VM and let's say you are building a uh, or deploying application using an immutable manner. Uh, so every time there is a change to the application, you are creating a new image and replacing the existing with a new one, right? So let's say your VM image is about 450 MB. What it is made up of? Your application is maybe 50 MB. Uh, maybe there is a dependency. Let's say this is a Java application. This is Tomcat and the rest, maybe some other dependencies and the underlying operating system. In total, it is 450 MB. Let's say you have created version one of the image and I have downloaded it and I'm launching my application with it. Now you created a version, uh, you have some application change. So you go from V1 to V2. When you do that, what you need to do is even though your application is just 50 MBs, you still have to rebuild the entire image because it's just one single image file uh, and you have to distribute that again. That is about 450 MB. That's what you do with VMs. With containers, it's very interesting because containers images can also be around the same size. It can be the same size, okay? Let's say this is 450 MB. Your application is 50 MB. You distributed this image. I have your version one of the image, I'm running it. Now you made a change to your application. You go from version one to version two. When you do that, you may build an image of 450 MB, but there will be only a delta here because every single thing here is a layer in the container. So I don't have to download the entire 450 MB to deploy your V2. That's the key here. I will only download the delta, like whatever you have changed, I will only download that much. And that is possible because container images are not one single file they're made up of multiple layers and the underlying technology used here for storing and managing and distributing these layers is called as a union file system a union file system or a very popular driver for it is overlay 2 so it's also called as the overlay file system so it's made up of these overlays or multiple layers and these are layers which are sitting on top of each other, like they get merged. Uh, the reason why they're called as overlays is because let's say you have file X here and you have file X here. Uh, if it gets merged or overlaid, uh, you will only see one copy of that, which is on the top layer. That's why it is called as an overlay. So it can mask the bottom layers also. And this makes the image distribution extremely efficient. I'll give you an example of that. Let me download an image and downloading a version four of my image. I don't have version one, two, three. Since I don't have those, it will download it, download the entire image. And you can see that it is downloading layer by layer, not one big image. It is downloading layer by layer. Each of this layer has a size and uh, that's what it is doing. This is the first time I'm downloading. So it downloads all the layers that's what you see now i'll down go from v4 to v5 so i'm just downloading the next version of the same image it might have some changes and what is going to happen now is it will only detect uh, detect the changes and say already exist for everything else and only the layers which changed the delta is what it is downloading right so even if i see this being 83.6 MBs, there are a lot of common layers. The only changes are these three top layers, which will be very minute difference. So I can also look at, there is a command to look at the layers also, Docker image history, very useful command. 
and you will note that between v4 and v5 like most of the layers are common like up, up to this these layers are common and only this much is a delta so maybe about 6 kb is what the difference is and uh, if i go from version 5 to ver if i download version 6 as well it probably will download just a few layers right everything else it will say already exist now this is an advantage of using this technology technologies like this make containers very compelling and uh, interesting solution here and you can see that it says already exist and it only downloads three layers which probably have changed that's it so between the versions i don't have to download the entire large image uh, the entire image i just download the delta it's like rsync just the delta and uh, that makes it super efficient to distribute the images all right so that's about the uh, you know i'm going to take one question from savana here uh, savana asks can we create windows container in linux vm now that's what is not possible because we share the same kernel uh, kernel is the one which is creating this isolated environment that what we call as a container so what is possible what is not is on linux you can create different linux distributions as containers because ultimately no matter what distribution of linux is centos or red hat or Zy, you know suze or ubuntu or debian ultimately the kernel is the same linux is just a kernel right and you have a distribution different distribution behaves differently but the core the kernel is the same so you can run any linux on linux right you can run windows container directly on windows so if you want to run windows container you need a windows operating system as well it has to be symmetric because you need a windows kernel which supports containers and then you run a windows uh, container on top of that right if you want to run linux container on windows how does that work on windows or mac so the way this works is on windows or mac earlier this used to be completely via vm on windows or mac system you would create a vm either using a Hyper-V on Windows or Mac has a uh, similar technology called a Zive. And using that, you create a VM. And on top of this is a VM is a Linux environment. And op on top of that, you run Linux containers. That's how you would run Linux containers earlier. Windows also has another option where along with the Windows kernel, they also ship something called as a WSL. Now, WSL2 is a newer version of that. So Windows subsystem for Linux, meaning you have a windows kernel and let's say there is a house and one room in that house is where you see linux right like you have a kid's room and it's completely different than the rest of the house so that's the linux uh, room and within that room it has the linux environment so it's basically a windows system but one corner is linux it's a subsystem uh, for linux so it has a linux kernel as well and you can run natively the linux containers directly here you can't do the opposite though so on on ubuntu system you can't run a windows containers that's not even possible so you need a windows system to run the windows containers just to clarify that okay so there's another question from karthik about the image so when you download let's say v6 and v5 and v4 what happens if i delete v5 now what happens there is the common layers will not get deleted only those three layers which are different between v4 v5 v6 those will get deleted so even if i see this docker image ls uh, i can delete this image v5 that is but still see it only deleted few right still you have uh, v4 and v6 which with those common layers those common layers exist those do not get deleted because there is someone who's using it so far that's what happens so it's very seamless uh, you know you don't have to really be bothered about oh, whether my layer get deleted and all that it is taken care of automatically okay so what we talked about was overlay file system as well and uh, the next technology under the hood 
is called as copy and write or cow very interesting technology here as well so what happens is let's take vms with vms let's say you have a template or an image using that image you're running a vm now when you launch a vm what happens first is it first clones the image so let's say you launch it from an image the first thing that happens is that image gets cloned now two things happen here number one is it will take time to clone that image so when you're booting off a vm or creating a new vm uh, it may be a few seconds but that much time gets added to the boot time that's number one. Second thing is it is cloning that image so it is consuming that much more space so if you have 500 mb worth an image when you clone it let's say you're launching 10 vms with the same image on the same system we are talking about 5 gigs plus the original 500 mb and that much of disk space being consumed here with container this is very interesting because you have an image sure image can be 500 mbs that's possible but when you launch a container with it let's say you launch two containers with it it is not going to clone that image it's just going to take the original image and mount it as read only right what does that mean so i have an image here i create two containers out of it i already have one running on the left I'll create one more same image two containers right so this is one container this is second container using the same image both of those are using the same image essentially mounted on it and what does that mean is it does not clone so even if I have 10 containers running we are talking about just 500 MBs plus maybe a change change as in whatever you change on the container uh, that's it so it is super efficient again and not only that it is also super fast so even if you have a large image with container uh, it doesn't take time to clone so it is much faster to start and boot so you know you, you can see that it just launched it in like less than a second so it launches in milliseconds actually uh, that's how fast it is and one of the reason is this basically now if it is mounting this as a read only you may have a question that oh is this a read only container let's find out so let me go inside this container and uh, try to write some file i can write a file so it's not a read only so what happens here is in addition to this you get a writable layer so there is a read only file system sure but every container has its writable layer you can see that uh, i just connected to this container second container and wrote there so i can also examine the changes that i'm making using docker diff just like git diff you clone a repository you make changes you can diff it you can do that with docker as well so docker diff for this container shows me that there is a file called as test that I've added and I can create some more files t1, t2, t3.txt uh, whatever and I see all that as part of a diff all these files right now this change will not be part of this first container this is the second container that I connected here and that's what I'm changing this container even though it is using the same image it doesn't have any diff that is because every container like this particular container second container has its own writable layer so whatever i'm changing it's happening local to this container to this layer and you can take this changes and commit it into an image as well so that's also possible and this technology is called as a copy and write uh, the reason for this name is because if suppose you make a change to a file which is already present here in the original image let's say a file called as x xyz.conf what's present here you made a change from here what happens is whenever you change that file or update it from here this file gets copied to this writable layer xyz.conf because this is read only so whatever changes have to happen here so this file gets copied here and that is the reason why it is called as copy on write when you try to edit from here the file gets copied here that's why it is called as copy on write or 
cow. Now, these four technologies which make containers possible and interesting and compelling are namespaces, C groups, the union mount or the overlay file system or and the copy on write technology. And these are the things you must really understand and know uh, in order to understand how containers work really. Right? That's how uh, this works. Uh, any questions so far? If you have any questions, you can start adding it to the Q&A out there or put it in the chat. Okay, I see a question from Cedric about uh, how do you go about containerizing an application? Is there a standard procedure to do it? How do you go step by step containerizing? Um, sure. Uh, how do we go about containerizing the application? Uh, the answer to that is basically you build an image by packaging your application. And to do that, you write a Docker file. And that's our second mission. So when we come back next week, that's what we talk about. The second mission here, the containerize here, is uh, all about Docker files. Uh, how do we package it? And we'll take this application example, one of the application, one of the services, and learn how to containerize it step by step. I'll show you from scratch next week. All right, which are the underlying file system used by containers is another question from Pradeep. So the between the host and the container, um, nothing is shared. It has its own set of file systems. So everything that you see here as part of the root file system is isolated and exclusive to this container. It is not sharing or using anything from the host unless you mount something specifically. All right, so uh, is the copy and write, uh, okay, let me see if I can explain this better. So basically copy and write is, um, if I make a change, so let's say there is a file, I'm in a container, and uh, the original image has a file in ETC. Let's just take this example. So I'm editing this file. I don't have VI, so yeah, VI is there. So I'll add my own, let's say, name server here. Uh, typically we add uh, write something like this. To resolve.conf. So what's happening now is this file got copied to this container as in you'll see it in the diff. Right, so whatever I'm changing. It should show up in the diff actually. 9c, 9c, 9c docker diff doesn't show me that it has changed. Yeah, this one. So ideally this should show me as change C. Uh, I'll try to find out why it does not. So this is the copy and write. So basically when I change the file inside the container, uh, it cannot write back to the original image. So what does it do is it creates a copy of that on this system, on this container. And uh, that is what I'm expecting to see here. Uh, the reason for this to not happen, I will try and find out, right? So that's the expectation. That's the copy and write technology where this file should get copied here in the writable layer. Maybe it is getting copied, but not showing in the diff. Uh, I'll try to find that answer to it because it's changed and it is not changed in, let's say, if it had been changed in the image, you would see the same in the other container as well. It does not, right? So there is a two different copies and whatever is changed in container two is local to that and not reflecting in the other container. Both are using the same image, right? So that's the idea. That's the example of like copy on write where you have uh, a changes which happen uh, in one container and it remains local to that. Okay, so from an interview type questions, it will be um, what, uh, I mean, some 
organizations may go deeper and ask you about the underlying technologies related to containers. Some others will just ask you uh, about uh, to get started with how to launch containers. What are the options? How do you uh, stop? I mean, there could be very specific questions related to maybe volume. How do you operate containers? How do you troubleshoot containers? Uh, how do we do the port mapping? Maybe uh, what happens if you define a port mapping? It could be any kind of a question based on uh, kind of organization and the role that you are being interviewed for. Okay, in container, the root file system should be immutable uh, is the question. So Satish, immutability comes when you are talking about deploying it in a Kubernetes-like environment where any changes means you replace the containers. You don't go in Kubernetes environment, you don't go and update the containers with the next version of the application and so on. You build a new version of the image you throw away those containers and you replace those. That's the immutable deployment. When you're using containers locally, you can very much, very much make changes. You can treat them as VMs. You can do whatever you want. Uh, those are not always like immutable as such. But when you talk about deployment in production like environment, typically we use a immutable approach there, right? So immutability matters there. Okay. Akshay has this command system CTL is not there here because it's a container. So container does not come with system D or system C, uh, system CL actually. All right, but there could be another reason. We'll try to discover it. All right. So uh, let me take you to with the interest of time. I'm going to talk about how do we run containers. So I'm going to go on to the next topic where we'll be talking about how do we run and operate containers so that we move towards our mission of launching this stack with uh, Docker and uh, uh, lead to that. So what are the things you need to know about is how do you launch containers? Uh, where do the images come from? Uh, what are the options that we want to use? How do we access the application running as a container? And uh, for that, I need an environment which is what I already have here. The one I'm showing you around is an Docker environment. And you can use Docker desktop to install it or set up a Linux environment like I have. So I'm using a server on DigitalOcean cloud. Uh, that's what I typically do, create a server there and install Docker on it directly. And that's what you see here. So you see the client and server version. This is the first validation. And how do we launch containers is using Docker run. So Docker is a utility, the client that we use. There is a Docker daemon, which is running and listening on a socket. So this is the response from the server, right? So that's what you see here. You can also use Docker system info to find out more information about your server. How many containers are there? How many of are running? How many images are there? What are the configurations? Uh, so you can get very detailed output with Docker system info. Uh, let me delete these containers first so that I can show you how to launch them from scratch. And what I'm going to do is I will also show you how things work when you launch the containers on the server side the daemon side. So I will use Docker system events. I'll be watching these events and I'll explain these events as I launch the container. So containers need images in the first place. Images come from the registry. An example of the registry is Docker Hub, which is hub.docker.com, right? That's the most commonly used registry. This is like GitHub. So if I have a GitHub and project like Craftista here, uh, you can see that I have a repository and you can have a similar named repository as well. So you can have a Craftista repository, but what makes your repository different than mine? I'll give you a better example. Let's say I have a front end app here. And you may have another front end application. So what makes your front end application different than mine or how it becomes different is through this namespace, my organization, my username, my, uh, you know, project name, whatever it is, right? This is the namespace. So UDBC slash front end is mine versus XYZ slash front end would be yours. 
So it works the same way here as well. I may have an image for, let's say MySQL. I want to launch MySQL. There are MySQL images. So there is a MySQL officially created by Docker. That's why it doesn't have any namespace. And there is an image created by CircleCI. There is one created by Bitnami, right? And just like Git has tags, so this front end may have uh, application may have releases which are tagged like this. You have images which are also tagged here, typically based on the version of MySQL here. Those will be the tags. And what operating system, base operating system it has been created with and so on. So the images come from the registry and some images do not have namespaces. Those are official images like this and images have different versions. So this is a repository. This is called as a repository. And how do I pull an image is something like this. So Docker image pull, I can say MySQL, just MySQL. Every image has four different components though. I can see it, it's just implicitly defined. So this actually translates to something like this. So docker.io, so where does this, where is it hosted, which, which registry? Uh, docker.io which namespace in this case it's default um, the root namespace owned by docker which is called as library and then it has mysql image that's the application it's called as repository and then it can have a tag the default is this so even if you see mysql the actual fully qualified name of that is docker.io library mysql and latest something like that right that's what it is. So if I want to launch a container, I need an image. So I can provide this or I can just say Docker image pull MySQL and latest. Something like this as well. So the number three, this is mandatory. The rest are optional actually. So let me show you. Yeah, so this is how it looks like. So if I have an image like this that I want to launch it with, the container with, uh, this translates to something like this. So registry or docker.io slash user slash uh, uh, repository slash the version, the tag basically. That's how the images are. Uh, and you can just use a short name like this. And let me show you by launching a container first using Docker. Let's say run and I am going to run a container with an image called as Alpine and uh, I'll use a specific version of that. What is Alpine? Alpine is just another operating system like Debian, Ubuntu and uh, this is a tiny little operating system. You can see the, uh, if I show you the tags, these are the versions and you can look at the size of it. It's very tiny. It's about three in, uh, odd MBs. This is a compressed size. And when it expands again, it will not be too much either. So if you compare it with uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu also, the container version is tinier than VM, sure, but it still has uh, some significant size in comparison, about 30 MBs or so, right? Compressed version versus Alpine is just about uh, two or three MBs. So it's that small. And uh, uh, it's a usable operating system, works well, uh, tiny little secure operating system it is. Uh, and that's what I use for, uh, when I want to just do a smoke test, I'll typically use Alpine. So uh, this is the version of Alpine and you can pick any of this version, any of this tag, let's say 3.19 I want to run or 3.18 let's say, one version less. So if I just want to launch a container, uh, Containers need an objective. You can't just launch a container like a VM, right? It's not a general purpose operating system. So you have to define an objective and only then will it uh, work basically. So I launch a container with let's say some objective in this case, just a shell. So Docker run this and shell. And uh, what happens here is it will try to pull this image first, right? and then it will launch 
whatever I ask it to run. Or it can be a simple command as well, like uh, ls, for example, right? Or it can be some command like if config. And what happens behind the scene is when I use that command to launch a container with, it starts with, uh, it goes through these stages basically. So it pulls that image for the first time. Second time it did not. Uh, it pulls the image if it is not present. Then it creates a container, attaches to it, connects the network, starts the container, and uh, then it died also. See what happened here. Uh, let's find out. And if I want to see, list the containers I use Docker PS, I don't see any. So what happened in the, here, right? Behind the scenes, let's find out. So when you use a command like this, docker run, docker run is what you use to launch a container and you have to provide an image. You have to provide a application or a purpose to launch a container with, right? Without a purpose, there is no container. Remember that always, right? So we use docker container run or docker run with both are same, the image and let's say some command like uptime. Now what happens with this command is it goes through these stages where these are the events. So you have a Docker daemon, we have a Docker client and it connects to uh, the daemon. It tries to pull an image from the registry if it is not present. Then using that image, it creates a container basically. Uh, after creating the container, Docker attaches to the process running inside that container. That is how it monitors the process. That is how it gets the logs. That is how it knows whether the process is running. It can restart the process if you provide a restart policy and so on. And that's what happens here. And then it will connect uh, the network and basically it will start the process. It will start running that basically after that, right? Now, uh, after launching, that's when you see, when you say run, uh, that's when you see the output of like if config, the output of that uh, happens here when it starts running the process. After running the process though, once the process stops, it will just go away. So it will die or disconnect. It will stop basically or die or disconnect here. The reason for that is till the time the application is running, now these are one of commands like ls, if config, even if I use uptime, right? Every time run something like this, it creates a new container. You will see that in the bottom as well. It creates a new container, follows the same process. It starts the container, runs uptime. The output of that is here. The output of if config is here. And this is a one of command. That soon as the command exits, container thinks that or Docker thinks that, oh, the job is over. It is successfully done. So let's uh, kill that, right? Or stop it basically. So container goes in a stopped state. That's the reason why I do not see this container running. Docker PS shows me only the currently running containers. If I want to list more, I have to use something like Docker PS minus L shows me the last run container minus N and the number like last two, last three. Or if I want to see all, minus A shows me that. You see all of these are in exited state, meaning they're stopped. They're not running anymore. They're exited state, right? And that's what happens. So when you, you know, stop the, uh, run the container, it will launch the application. If it goes and exits immediately, the container also stops right there, right? Now, how do you make sure that it keeps running is you have to use some options like these. So we'll continue to observe the output in the bottom. And this time, instead of using Docker run just like this, I'll add two options here or two things I'll change here. One is I'll use an option that is hyphen I followed by hyphen T. And then I'll start a shell. Why shell is because if I want to keep running the application, I need some application which will keep running. And then I want to connect to something, right? Like I want to get a feel of how containers work. So I launch a shell so that I can connect to it. And then I use this hyphen IT options. Hyphen IT option stands for interactive and allocating TTY. So hyphen I is interactive, 
i fun t is to allocate tty or terminal now what does that mean is i can interact with shell and then to interact with the shell i get a tty so when i'm connect to this server i'm using a pseudo terminal that's a tty and that's what happens here so it gives me a pseudo terminal to connect and this time the container is launched uh, it got attached the docker attached to it it started but it did not die or disconnect it just resized it's that copy on write and it's just resizing because of that and i'm inside the container now i can examine it and you can see uh, you can examine let's say uh, what's there in the network the processes and uh, what not you know the operating system and host name it has its own host name as well and you can examine all of that there right as long as i am on this shell the container is running the moment i exit it will again die and the network gets disconnected right that means it stopped again right because the shell is not stopped so it got stopped as well if you want to keep running for a longer time what you need to do is in addition to this you have to use a hyphen d option hyphen d is the you can think of it as a default option but hyphen d is the option that we use for detaching meaning what does that mean is i'll show you so i'm going to use an image here and i will not use hyphen d so i'll show you the significance of hyphen it significance of hyphen d so okay this is the image and my application name is program see what happens so it will download the image and then after that it launches the application and it is connected to the application meaning it is attached to the application who is attached to the application docker daemon is and that's why we see this uh, here the problem with this is you are attached to it so you can't go and run all the commands and you're stuck with it kind of right and you typically don't want that most of the time unless you're debugging you don't want that you just want to launch the application and go to the next one and just proceed with your work right so how does that work right now we are not using hyphen d that's why we need hyphen d if you use hyphen d it will run in a detached mode by default uh, but we have something else here that is hyphen int the significance of this is with hyphen int i can interact with whatever the application is in this case program interact as in i can send some signals to that and one signal that i will send typically is uh, detached signal is control p followed by control q so control p followed by control q will help me detach detach as in it's graceful as in it still keeps running you'll see the container is still running okay that's a detach mode so i can detach using control pq if i do not have hyphen it i cannot detach i'll show you i'm attached now launch the application i start using control p control q none of that works the only thing that will work is control c which will mean i will kill this container it should be gone it's gone this is the one which is running from earlier because i could detach from it so what do you use typically is you use hyphen d by default which will just launch a container in detach mode this is the detach mode this is what we typically want you want to launch a container and proceed and come back to the shell and the container should keep running in the background uh, gracefully that is what we want you can always attach to it so you can do use docker attach and say this is the container id how do you reference a container by the way is you can use the first, uh, this is the ID, this is the name. You can also use a glob like this. So 42, if it is unique, you can use that. 42, 6, 46 typically will be unique. 1 to 5 will be unique mostly. So you can also reference it as that. So if I want to attach, I'll say Docker attach 4 to 6, the container which starts with container ID 4 to 6. These are the first 12 characters of the container ID. These are unique on the host. This name is also unique. And I can attach it like this, which takes me back to the same output. This is the output of that program application running in it within that. 
and I can again detach using control P followed by control Q that's that right so you can always do that so you can attach detach if you have hyphen IT that works and hyphen D is kind of a mandatory option that we use to launch the container in a detached mode by default now I have a couple of containers running in the background I may want to do some troubleshooting sometimes uh, so for troubleshooting maybe you want to check the logs so you can use docker logs command for that and you can use logs and let's say four to six or you can follow the logs using docker logs minus f shows you the logs here i can follow the logs it's similar to that you know attaching it but in this case it's just collecting the logs how does docker knows about the logs is docker attaches let me show you that docker attaches docker daemon attaches to the application running inside the container so whatever what does that mean is it is attaching to the standard out and standard error by default if you know about input outputs uh, and input and output streams right three there are three streams input output and error right so standard error standard input standard output standard error so by default docker attaches to the standard out and standard error and that's how it gets the log so it is attached to the application so you never start the application in a demonized mode with docker you always run it in a foreground mode and docker attaches to it and that's how this works right so that's uh, uh that's how this works basically so Hari Krishna has a question about what are the most common activities in a Docker in real time? Well, you can run an application, you can connect to it, you can connect to the application port running on it, you can do the troubleshooting like this. Uh, those are the things that you do with a application in mind. All right, so, okay. Another question by John is I'm um, using older version and want to update to new. If it is Docker and Docker desktop, it should remain the same. Uh, right now what all what else can you do with docker containers right so um, so on streams uh, basically whatever let's say you have an application uh, application is sending the output so whatever the output is is called as a standard out that's what you see here so typically whatever let's say web server a web server receives request for every request, it sends something on uh, as a log, uh, saying that this is the request received on uh, from this source. Uh, this was the error. Uh, this was the code exit response code. This was the actual request, and this is what happened, and all of that. It keeps on sending that as a uh, output, and that's your standard output. Sometimes you get an error, like this is the error that happened. There's a 404 error. And this was the request received from this host, and that becomes an error, standard error, basically. So that is considered as an error. Uh, that's the error stream. And input is whatever we talk to. So input is like I just press that control P, or input is uh, I'll give you a better example for input. Uh, I launch a container called as Dockly. It's a uh, kind of an interface command line graphical interface of sorts like this helps you ma manage docker host and this is where i'll provide the inputs so it will launch an application it's a graphical interface on command line so it's a n curses application as it is called and this is a good example of the hyphen i option right hyphen i for interacting the standard input it gets you here and that is basically whatever you're interacting with like providing some inputs on a terminal that's your standard in so whatever i'm doing here it's an input so let's say i want to see the uh, logs for this so i'll say enter and i see the logs that's a standard input i'm interacting with this application i want to see uh, let's say see the info for this that's an input escape is an input uh, again i will say delete or q q for quit that's an input so that's how i'm interacting that i'm i was interacting because i had a standard input attached to that application as well the application standard input i was attached to that using hyphen i 
by default docker attack gets the standard out and error and that's what you see with logs and when you interact like this that's the standard input so logs are like this so this is what the logs are and if there is an error you will typically see it here itself the the problem or the error you'll typically see it here itself that's a standard error right so uh, that's how it works so docker attaches to it and if you use hyphen i you also get a standard in so you have all access to all three streams uh, now hyphen idt is what we typically use to launch containers logs is how we get the uh, output and the error the logs for the application and if you want to get inside the container to do further debugging like how you connect to a vm using ssh now you can't SSH to a container because there is no SSH running. So you can use exec hyphen IT typically, take the container ID and open a shell, maybe a SH or bash, depending on what is available in that container's image. And that gives you access to the container. And it's like SSH access. And this is a Linux environment with Alpine. So I can use APK update. I can do whatever else I want here, right? apk add vim. This is how I install packages on it. Just install vim. So you can do whatever else you want with exec command. So exec gives you access. It's like SSH like access to an existing container. The difference between docker run and docker exec is docker run will launch a container. Docker exec helps me connect to the existing container and launch a shell and connect to it inside. This is like establishing a SSH-like connection inside, right? That's how it works. Now, the next thing, now you can go and look at these topics in depth through the course that I have, uh, but I'm gonna talk about from the times point of view, I'll be talking about a few things. And the next thing that we'll talk about is, let's say, I want to launch a web application. Like when you launch an application like this, let's take this Craftista. And as part of this mission, the project that you will do is, uh, uh, there's a project specification somewhere here. Let me bring it up. The first project that you will do will be launching this application stack and uh, coming up with something like this right that's the first out you know part of our first mission and the project related to that so how would you go about it is what i will demonstrate to you i have a web application i want to launch it and connect to it right so maybe the front end for craftista or i'll take another application for now and show you that first and then i'll demonstrate the craftista for you let's say i have a web application i want to run i also want to access it to do that, I do something called as port mapping. I'll explain that. First, let me launch it. So docker run hyphen IDT. These are the common options. And then I have an application by name vote. You can name it like this. You can use an image uh, like this. Yeah. And then uh, it will automatically launch the application based on the metadata. Now, for this, I will also add one more option that is small p, 8080. Uh, observe the difference here, right? So in the output here, there will be something new this time. So it has launched, it has picked up the application automatically. Where does this come from is the image metadata. This is the image I have. An image has uh, uh, what application to launch, all of that is part of its metadata. How do you add it is what we're gonna look at next time with Docker file, but Docker image history, I'll show you the image. This is the image I launched with. These are the layers of that image. And one of the layer defines the application, just a metadata. So use this unicorn. This is a Python web server. So this is the Python Flask application and this is how it launches. And it also defines which port the application listens on or runs on, that is what it defines here expose 80. And if you look at the command that I used to launch this with, it says 8000 colon 80. So 80 is here. There is something else as well. That's what you see here. Now, what has happened here is, and why I did this is because 
we are running a container the container is running inside a host so there is a host there is a container running within that the container has its own ip this is like a private network inside this host right so i cannot connect using this private ip i can reach out to the host which is on a public ip or in your case it might be local host but i cannot get inside that container so what do i do is do a port mapping so i map a port on the host side to the container this is like in your home network you set up a web server let's suppose you took, took a older machine sitting in your home you converted into a web server and you can access it locally from when you are at home you can use some private ip to access it but when you go out sit in a cafe somewhere you can't access it using this ip so there is a way to do that though which is you define some port forwarding on your router if your router has a public ip if it is dynamic ip or static ip doesn't matter you can use a public ip and then do a port forwarding so this port 8000 here forwards to 80 port so if you access this public ip colon 8000 you reach to the container or a host server in your home network a private network you can do the same with docker using this port mapping concept so there is a container running on a host we can't access it directly it's running on port 80 so we use the host and one of the port on the host and say we map this port to this port 80 that's what has happened here this host port 8000 is gone to 80 and this is implemented by some ip table rules so you'll see ip table rule here so if a request receives on port 8000 it is sent to the container this is the container's ip and port 80 so it basically when you have a port mapping it sends this request to that container so i can access using my host ip what is my host ip uh, in my case it's a local uh, public ip it's a server running on a digital ocean so i can use this colon 8000 to access it you can see that application running it's the same container because if i stop that container this should also stop it's now running also you can see the container id itself starting a4 ending 64 starting a4 ending 64 right that was the container let me start it again yeah it works so how do i launch an application like this right uh this application is made up of multiple services i'll just show you one application or one front end just launching a front end provided i have an image uh which is defined here so if i want to launch front end i use this image this is the port mapping the application runs on port 80 3000 and i will uh, access it on port 80 i'll try to do that i'll just launch front end i will not launch rest of the things here right so what i'll do is it's simple as this so docker run hyphen idt you can use capital p small p whatever so i can define a particular port mapping like i want to access it on port 80 on my host the actual container port is 3000 if i'm not sure i can also check it by pulling the image because when i pull the image i shall see which port it is supposed to run on you can discover that using uh, what command it will be docker image history and uh, this one you can see that it's a node application listens on port 3000 
3000 and if I run it I will say 3000 and launch this container yep now I can access it on port 80 same IP same host port 80 and you can see that it just shows me that front end has a host name ending 7b so my docker container ending 7b that's the one uh, that's why this application is also useful because you can see find out which container name is what is the ip address of that uh, we also detect whether it is running inside a container or not whether it is running on kubernetes or not right that's why this application is quite useful from a learning point of view backends are not up and uh, then the whole project the mission and the project for you for this week would be to launch this and connect it with the backend services and you can connect the backend services by launching those first and then you can have some link options that's something i'm going to have you discover right so uh, you can see i have uh, all of this connected and i'm going to launched certain containers i used some link options as well like linking is how you connect one service with another right so this is something i want you to discover uh, do a little bit of research on your own and uh, uh, those of you who are members you will have access to the project you will also have whatever i've taught so far is also part of the course that we have and uh, there is let me show you so this is our uh, devops mastery system as we call it this is our login dashboard so it's not just a course uh, I'm also going to talk about this membership. So those of you who are not members, uh, this could be useful for you. Those of you who are members, you're going to access, uh, uh, you will see the challenge. Once you're logged in, you will see the challenge here, this ongoing challenge. And these are the missions. So this is an interactive kind of a progress map. And you will complete the missions. Uh, and as you complete the missions, this will open up for you. The next missions will open for you and uh, uh, you will also see the progress there. So we have codified the uh, roadmaps, the missions, all of that for you. And for this week and the next week, you will be working on the Docker course, the Docker mastery course. So uh, whatever I've taught so far, plus more topics will be part of that. Docker Mastery this is what you're going to get started with. Right, the basics of uh, containers, how do we, uh, the concepts that we talked about, plus uh, a little more. Uh, how do we run and operate containers? That's the one you are going to complete. And once you understand that, uh, you are going to complete a project. Next week, we are going to come back and look at uh, building container images and uh, those concepts. But for this week, you will complete this session, like the topics, go through those. And I'm adding the projects right here. And the first week's project uh, and the mission uh, will be here. And I'll be, we'll be adding and talking about the solutions as well. And uh, for you, the first mission is to launch uh, this entire stack and get to the stage that you see somewhere uh, on my system here. Right, this kind of a stage. What I just launched for the first service is this, and then you can add more services, have them connected, and in eventually, uh, this is an actual environment running on another system, and it is all connected. I just did a test here today, and uh, you see the you know, you know the block service, the recommendation service, the voting service, everything being up. When it becomes up, uh, automatically all of this will show up. So your task for this mission is to learn how to run containers actually launch these containers and get to that stage and plus i'll be adding a treasure hunt for you that you will complete as part of uh, this session and if you want to get access to all these courses uh, the projects the labs uh, we have this geek membership which is what i'm going to talk about uh, very briefly and this is part of our devops mastery system that we have built uh, which is like a journey and it 
opens up a roadmap for you. So you can take any of these journeys from sysops to cloud ops to DevOps to, you know, like SRE uh, to DevSecOps and so on. And we have different levels that you can complete. And uh, this is part of our initial challenge for DevOps, but there are many courses. This is made up of courses, coaching, community, and challenges. And we have many courses right from the career roadmap, which is the starting course to get you clarity. Uh, we have a course on AI and how to use it in DevOps. We have an introductory course on DevOps and SRE. Uh, there's a system engineering bootcamp on Linux system engineering, basically. These are the foundational courses. And then we have additional courses like Docker Mastery. There's a Kubernetes, very detailed Kubernetes Mastery course, which also helps you prepare towards CKA, CKAD exams. There is a AWS, Ansible and Terraform. These are the foundational master plus mastery courses. And then there are many other courses, like I've authored courses for Linux Foundation, for example. Some of these are very sophisticated, like very detailed course on CI, CD, for example. Uh, we have one on containers for dev developers and QA. There's a GitOps course. There is a DevSecOps course, a very useful course for most of you. Uh, a detailed course on DevSecOps, all sort of security practices. All of these courses, you can take it from Linux Foundation as well. Uh, you can check it on their sites too, or you can uh, take it from our membership platform where the entire uh, course library along with the weekly live coaching. This is part of our coaching system. We also have a Thursday uh, evening calls, uh, weekly inner circle calls as we call it for the members. And we have, you will get access to the community which we are trying to grow and trying to make it more active. And the challenges like what we have right now, you'll have access to different challenges. Like we did a Kubernetes challenge uh, in last quarter. This time we are doing a DevOps, uh, 90 day DevOps challenge, which is like a hackathon uh, that you see here. So the entire value of this is more than like one like thirty five thousand, and all of this is available as a membership platform for about two hundred forty nine dollar uh, dollars or fourteen triple nine. And as part of this webinar, we have a special offer for you, which is what you get at around one seventy nine or nine 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 for a year, right? So this is the yearly nerd membership plan, and I'm gonna present this offer which will be available for you for the next, uh, let's say 15 minutes, right? So let me share the offer codes with you in case if you want to go for it. And uh, we have two different links. One, if you are from India, uh, you can use this link to register and get this membership. And if you are uh, not from India, for international members, we have another link. That's a Stripe link. That's a different get gateways. So you'll get it for about 119 or 9999, uh, you know, rupees basically. That's the price that you're gonna get for the next uh, for as part of this webinar for attending this webinar. It's actually 179 and uh, triple uh, 9999 rupees. So that's the correction here. So that's what you're gonna get it for 179 or 9999. Uh, that's the yearly price for this membership. And you get access to the challenge, the project, the solutions, the labs, and all the courses which you're going to complete as part of this. Right. So uh, I will be taking the questions now. Uh, I'm also going to enable, if you want to ask the questions uh, vocally, I'll be enabling you to speak. So I have enabled that too. And uh, if there are any pending questions, I'm just going to go through it. If you have any further questions, you can also uh, put it in the chat or in the Q&A section out there. Right, so I've answered most of these questions. So um, there's a question from Amit about how do we replicate this session um, about the environment? So uh, you will get to learn the concept, but if you really want to do it, uh, the best way to do that is to take the membership. You will have access to the recording though. So if you want to do it on your own, just watching the recordings, uh, feel free to do that. But uh, mainly these classes are to get you a build, help you build a conceptual understanding, get you the demonstration and uh, the access to the project library, uh, the courses is available for the member and it's a very reasonable price, uh, reasonably priced membership that you can take uh, as well to get started with, right? And that's gonna help you accelerate your career 
and help you build and upscale your career with DevOps Mastery, right? At, uh, at a very reasonable price that you get paying for it. Okay, so uh, namespaces, we've already talked about. Namespace is a concept which is available in containers. It's also available in Kubernetes, which is a slightly different thing. Uh, Windows versus Linux containers, I've already answered that. Okay, about older version to newer version, uh, your data should remain same. Um, that shouldn't be a problem if you are just upgrading the Docker desktop, that is. Okay, so which are the important com configuration files where Docker and where Docker logs are kept? Uh, good question. So typically Docker has this daemon.json configuration and Docker logs are kept uh, here. So basically, if you look at, uh, let's say I want to find the log path. I can check Docker inspect in the container. And you get a lot of information when you use Docker inspect. One of that is a log path. So on the system, it is an var lib Docker containers. And uh, this is the actual log path. So a log path for a container, this particular container is here, right? And this is the actual log. And where is it typically kept is var lib Docker has a, a your file system, the images are here, overlay two. These are all images. The, each of the layer is a directory here. That's the overlay file system. Every container has a writable layer. That's what you see here. Now, the images, the overlay configuration, a lot of these files are here. Apart from that, there is a docker daemon.json file available on your system. And uh, that's the configuration file that you want to edit in case if you want to change something related to Docker, right? So that's uh, uh, another file which you will typically use uh, to provide the configuration. I think it's varlib or it's etc. Uh, you know, it's part of the etc somewhere, that daemon.json file for Docker. Or you can create it actually if it is not present. All right, so about the recordings, the question from Betula is, uh, yes, so recordings will be available for the members for a longer time. Uh, if you're not a member, you will still have access to the recording for the five days. You will receive an email with the link to the replay or a recording, and you will have access to it for like 120 hours, about five days. Um, okay, so assignments are available. The projects are available for the members and uh, it's part of our portal already. So uh, the assignment for this week has already been uploaded. And basically, uh, once you are a member, you log in to uh, the portal, you can go through the challenge, and here you'll find what are the learning, the step-by-step -step basically, what are the things that you're learning, what is the project that you're completing, there'll be a treasure hunt that you have to complete as well. Uh, plus the project that I just described, you will have to complete that. So all of that will be uh, available to you uh, if you are a member. Right? So that's uh, uh, what it is. Okay, so um, what else is there in the chat? I'm just going to go through it uh, quickly. All right, for non-members, we don't have the assignments. You can follow rec the recordings and you can try it out. And you can benefit when you, uh, you know, um, become a member, you obviously get those benefits where you get access to the courses, labs, projects, and the uh, assignments as a project, basically. So uh, if you are not a member, you can still benefit out of the live sessions. So you can go through the live sessions and attend all the sessions which are available and open to all. Uh, rest of the content is uh, all available to the members. So. Uh, that's uh, what you can do and you can take the membership using the links which have been shared with you uh, We're gonna start maybe a free trial maybe but uh, right now we have uh, these offers going on which you can benefit out of right so That's what I would suggest uh, you can take uh, Abhimanyu has a question on uh, Jenkins Jenkins essentially is something that I'll be updating in the next uh, 10 days or so. So I'm uh, just working on this assignment and let's say the projects for this week and the next and then comes the Jenkins. So I'll be updating in the next 10 days. I want to redo the content for Jenkins. So that's why I'm not updated that yet. All right. 
how do we filter docker inspect to get the information that you need you can use some sort of templates uh, for getting um, docker inspect you can filter using grep of course uh, i generally use that because that's what i'm typically used to uh, so i'll just say grep and find a lock path or something like that right that's a quick way of doing that but you can also use some go templates and when you use docker ps and so on docker supports these go templates and it can take those templates to uh, help you get a specific output out of uh, anything really so you can use those templates for uh, with docker as well so i generally don't go the template way uh, i generally use the linux stuff so uh, grep is my friend and then i want to get some two lines after that uh, i'll use something like this maybe a few lines before that i can use maybe something like this so that's why the linux system engineering is important because if you want to understand how grep works uh, how to get things done here like this or search or do a more advanced search i can use grep awk z uh, there are many advanced things in linux itself plus docker does give you some things uh, so if you you provide go that way you can use the template for that or maybe use docker inspect some options with that let's see what option docker inspect supports so you have a format right so that's the thing so that's what i was talking about so you can use a go template provide that and it will format it in a certain way you can it can help you generate the reports that way that's uh, what you can do all right okay so i've uh, shared the offers with you in case if you want to go for the membership and uh, uh, we will come back next week and we'll be talking about how do we build container images we'll talk about how to write docker files i will actually demonstrate to you how uh, to write the docker file for this application i'll share this application by the way this application if you have, even if you're not a member you can always look at the application and uh, try to do the stuff that i'm doing and try to simulate that as well right this is the link to the application this is a, this is available on github it's a open source application that i have created and you can make use of that to uh, learn on your own or you can accelerate by uh, you know using the courses you can take a structured path to devops mastery as well so whichever way you prefer you can uh, take that approach right uh, with that we will conclude our sessions here uh, next week we come back and talk about building container images i'll take one application maybe the front end application show you how to write a docker file for it from scratch and we'll talk about docker files we'll talk about multi stage docker files and i'll give you some projects related to that as well so you will also uh, end up build let's say uh, images for the rest of the applications as well as part of the projects and then we go towards the next missions of you know gitification pipelineation cloudification or scalification terraform kubernetes ergo and monitorization so this is where we begin our uh, project so get start getting familiar with the project uh, start getting used to running containers uh, learn how to launch that entire stack that's what your task is for this week uh, for the members just follow this uh, sequence of steps in the challenge and you should be all set and we have the thursday uh, calls for the members you can if you have any questions uh, with this or anything else uh, we will address it and we'll take those questions during the call thursday uh, evening call as well for rest of you i will see you on the next uh, you know tuesday uh, at the same time and we'll uh, talk about how to build container images the art of writing docker file and more so Thank you very much and I'll see you uh, on Thursday or on next week. Bye-bye. That's all for today.